So you understand what's going on? Yeah, man, it's easy. Okay, cool. Alright, then it looks like you know what's going on. Older children may need less supervision, but they need your full support. A few tips for assisting children with online or home-based study. Check in regularly. Ask questions about what they are doing. Don't shout or get frustrated if they don't understand. Encourage them to take breaks from time to time. Be affectionate. Be positive. Sometimes a simple touch goes a long way. As much as possible, provide a comfortable space for children to work in. You may want to be more lenient with the desired study location for teens. Encourage them to focus by minimizing distractions such as television, music, or telephone. As much as possible, encourage them to separate their eating spaces from their study spaces, minimizing the risk of damaging devices. Parent Registration for Flow Study Step 1. Enter www.flowstudy.co the flow study site should open. If it doesn't, go to www.google.com. Enter flowstudy.co in the Google search engine. Step two, click on the link that opens flowstudy.co. Step three, click on get started in the upper right hand corner. Step four, select sign up. Now enter your email address in the box provided. Step 5. Get started using your email. Step 6. Select parent account. Enter your personal information and click next. Step 7. Create your password. Step 8. Select your country. Step 9. Link your account to your child's account by selecting Use Email. Step 10. Enter the email address given to you by the school and the password. Congratulations, you've just signed up as a Flow Study parent. touching the mask, clean hands with an alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. Take the mask and inspect it for tears or holes. Orient which side is the top side where the metal strip is. Ensure the proper side of the mask faces outwards, the colored side. Place the mask to your face. Pinch the metal strip or stiff edge of the mask so it molds to the shape of your nose. Pull down the mask's bottom so it covers your mouth and your chin. After use, take off the mask. Remove the elastic loops from behind the ears while keeping the mask away from your face and clothes. To avoid touching potentially contaminated surfaces of the mask, discard the mask in a closed bin immediately after use. Many people's income has been severely reduced as a result of the pandemic. There are real concerns about taking care of self and family in this current financial climate. In order to help to manage the stress and anxiety related to financial concerns, focus on gathering information. What concessions being offered by banks and businesses could I rely on to help me? Prioritizing. What bills must be paid first? Which ones could be deferred until a later time? Which ones could be negotiated? Brainstorming. What other activity could bring in an income at this time? 
Remember, financial concerns are very real and could lead to distress and worry if they are left unchecked. Finding a way to problem solve helps to reduce the stress and anxiety that come with financial woes. This message comes to you from the St. Kitts Mental Health Association. is on. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Emergency Operations Center COVID-19 Daily Briefing for the 12th of May, 2020. I am Les Roy Williams. Thank you very much for joining us for today's Daily Briefing. We continue to update you on information with respect to the management of the COVID-19 pandemic here in St. Kitts and Nevis, an all of society approach and all of government approach. Those of you joining us in the diaspora, a very warm welcome to you. Those of you joining us via television, radio, or social media, we also say a very warm welcome to the people in the British Virgin Islands and the US Virgin Islands who are tuned in to this daily briefing via the Caribbean Broadcasting Network. A warm welcome to all of you. Today, of course, is a very special day because it is the day that is set aside to observe International Nurses Day. And of course, we know that nurses all over the world have been on the front line, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. This highlights their work, their compassion, their dedication, their commitment to the healthcare system. So congratulations to all nurses here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis and further afield. Today to open our press briefing, we are going to have a presentation from Best for Less, who is going to be making a donation to the COVID-19 response to the Ministry of Health. So I would invite Anand Samtani from Best for Less to make a presentation to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws. Mr. Samtani. Good evening, everyone. First of all, let me thank Honorable Minister Ms. Phipps, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson, Dr. Hazel Laws, Mr. Williams, and Mr. Samuel, and the rest of COVID-19 action team. Um, now, on behalf of Mr. Ken Kelly, Pastor Leroy Benjamin of Office Machines Limited, Mr. Charles Wilkins QC, None of these distinguished gentlemen need any introductions. And myself, Anand Samtani of Best for Less, are donating EC dollars 6,000 towards the cause of COVID-19. Best for Less is proud and happy to be associated with Kittitians who have welcomed us with open arms when we first opened the business in St. Kitts in year 2002. Three ply surgical masks KN95 masks and locally made, locally made cloth masks are available at concessionary price 
in best well as at both the location on Bay Road, which is between KFC and Social Security, and on the corner of Church Street, opposite Anglican Church. And I must thank the staff who is working behind the scene that they have done a great job. Thank you very much. I have something else also. I have some games here for the people who work here. I don't want them to be on the cell phone all the time. They can play snakes and ladder, Ludo, oh, and chess. Hmm? We have, mount, we have mounted a comprehensive fight against the COVID-19 and the donations so far have been tremendous. And this afternoon, we are extremely happy uh, to receive the kind donations from uh, Mr. Santani from Best for Less. Thank you very much on behalf of the Ministry of Health and the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you, sir. And I also uh, want to say thank you uh, to the Jamaican Ketishan Nevision uh, Association, uh, who is uh, donating $1,000 uh, to the fight against COVID-19. So we want to say a hearty thank you to the Jamaican Ketishan Nevision Association. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Laws, and thank you very much Mr. Anand Samtani, representing Best for Less, for your donation. People continue to donate to the COVID-19 response, showing their solidarity with trying to eradicate, to fight the COVID-19 pandemic here in St. Kitts and Nevis. I would now like to invite Minister of State with Responsibility for Health, the Honorable Wendy Phipps to make an official address in observance of International Nurses Day, which is celebrated today. Minister Phipps. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Fellow citizens and residents of St. Kitts and Nevis, Today, May 12, 2020, St. Kitts and Nevis joins with the rest of the world in observing International Nurses Day. This year's observance is being executed under the theme, Nurses, a voice to lead, nursing the world to health. While it is true that this theme is an adaptation of the ones chosen for 2017 to 2019, this year's focus is being centered deliberately on the tall global order that has now been placed on the shoulders of nurses in every country, continent, and community in response to the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. As a result of the unprecedented impact of COVID-19 on all global citizens, our local nursing fraternity, like the rest of the international counterparts of theirs, are called upon to render critical nursing care in this time of greatest need to help heal the sick to comfort the dying and to remain stoic at the center of the healthcare continuum, even as the virus continues to leave a trail of infection, disease, death, and disruption that has left no region of the world unscathed. Thankfully for us in St. Kitts and Nevis, we do not share the horror stories of major pandemic hotspots such as Italy, Spain, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, or France. We are grateful to God that to date, we have had just 15 confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 14 recoveries, zero deaths, a high rate of testing, no community spread of the virus, close vigilance in terms of contact tracing and quarantine, and no need for hospitalization among those affected. This is a remarkable achievement for the smallest country in the Western Hemisphere 
and speaks volumes for the caliber of medical and technical leadership which this country has been blessed to have in our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, who is ably supported by our Medical Chief of Staff, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson, and a cadre of specialized support team leaders from within our public health system and the wider civil service. All milder COVID-19 experiences have enabled our nursing fraternity to be spared from the well-told realities in other countries where it has become the norm for nurses to suffer the ravages of extra long shifts due to the ongoing global shortage of nurses, heavy emotional and physical tolls, including heartbreak over the death of some of their colleagues to COVID-19, or being the sole individual at the deathbed of a COVID-19 patient whose family cannot be there to say their final goodbyes, extended separation from their own families, anxieties over insufficient supply of ventilators for critically ill patients, and insecurity over limited yet precious supplies of personal protective equipment, commonly referred to as PPE. Nevertheless, our local nurses have been well trained and are adequately resourced in terms of PPE, ventilators, and other critical medical equipment, and stand ready to address the healthcare needs of our citizens and residents who may present at our hospitals with COVID-19 symptoms. We say a sincere thank you to all of them for their service to our country and for their courage and willingness to make special sacrifices at this critical time in human history. Today, May 12, 2020, holds historic significance for nursing the world over. Today marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of the 19th century nurse Florence Nightingale, who is considered globally as the founder of modern day nursing. In fact, International Nurses Day is celebrated each year on May 12th out of respect and honor for this trailblazer who would have made a name for herself as she rendered stellar nursing service to soldiers on the battlefield during the Crimean War. Her laborious efforts to improve conditions in field hospitals, to integrate infographics in the presentation of medical data, and to pioneer professional nursing education are well documented for posterity in the annals of nursing history. Long before the COVID-19 pandemic had been so declared by the World Health Organization, the WHO, that premier global health authority had announced for the first time a year of the nurse and the midwife to be celebrated in 2020. The WHO would have made this declaration in light of A, the bicentenary of the birth of Florence Nightingale, and B, grave concern over the serious shortage of nurses and midwives in the delivery of quality health care. The WHO has estimated that in order to achieve the 2030 goal of universal health coverage, there needs to be added some 9 million more nurses and midwives to the current global pool of 28 million. Similar appeals have been documented by the Chief Executive Officer of the International Council of Nurses, the ICN, Mr. Howard Catton, in his International Nurses Day 2020 address. Catton also cites the ICN document, Nursing the World to Health, which he considers to be recommended reading for world leaders at this time when there is serious need to chart a new course in terms of the role, education, career development, working conditions, and retooling of the global nursing fraternity. Catton posits that in this exercise, there is the imperative to adequately respond to the emerging health threats that will still be looming large, even after the COVID-19 pandemic is over and the world settles into a new normal that is nebulous at best. I couldn't agree with Howard Catton more. I am happy to remind our citizens and residents that our team unity government has been addressing since taking office, the state of nursing in the Federation. As early as 2016, the St. Christopher and Nevis Nurses and Midwives Council, the Ministry of Health, the Human Resources Department of the Civil Service, and the nursing leadership within the community-based and institution-based healthcare settings have been addressing several inherited anomalies and challenges that were clearly evident upon Team Unity taking office in 2015. This process has included deliberations on the reclassification of certain nursing positions, 
recalibration of some pay scales, particularly among nurses who are singly or dually trained, analysis of local skills gaps with regards to specialized nursing in areas such as oncology, intensive care unit, the ICU, and neonatal care, and the assessment of the legal and professional standing of graduate nurses who have exhausted all attempts at sitting the licensure examination for nurse registration, among other matters. Citizens and residents who may have followed the 2020 budget debate in Parliament in December 2019 may have recalled that in my own defense of the budgetary allocation to the Federal Ministry of Health, I would have announced that after careful consideration, the 2020 budget was inclusive of an increase in salaries and wages for nurses. I would have also announced at that time that the total amount of funds earmarked for the pay raise under personal emoluments and wages in the budget document was EC $1,141,587. I'm advised that this budgeted increase in pay should be reflected in the salaries and wages of nurses from this month. The Federal Cabinet has also committed to continuing its engagement with the leadership of the nursing fraternity, the Nurses and Midwives Council, and the HRD in order to bring settlement to the aforementioned concerns of the nursing fraternity and nursing practice in general. The Federal Cabinet and the Federal Ministry of Health are quite cognizant of the fact that this year's observance of International Nurses Day will be vastly different from celebrations of previous years. As can be expected, this is due to the preoccupation of the Federation and the rest of the world for that matter in responding to the formidable threats to life, liberty, public health and public safety as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, in spite of these setbacks, the Cabinet feels that now more than ever is an ideal opportunity to celebrate our nurses here and elsewhere for their selfless service, their care, and their personal sacrifice in addressing the needs of our hurting and fractured world. The Cabinet takes this moment to salute all of our nurses, be they practicing in the public or private sectors. We remember at this time all retired nurses who have long blazed a trail for younger generations to follow and have laid a solid foundation for the advancements in public health that we take for granted today. On behalf of the federal government, I wish every nurse in our federation a happy International Nurses Day 2020. May God continue to bless the people of St. Kitts and Nevis with his unmerited favors of good health and wellness, even in the face of this monstrous global pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, the Honorable Wendy Phipps, for your address on the observance of International Women Nurses Day. I now invite Mrs. Celia Christopher, Director of the Department of Gender Affairs, to address us. Mrs. Christopher. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Celia Christopher. I am the Director of the Department of Gender Affairs, and I'm here today to inform the general public on the work of the department, as well as to give you an update on its activities as it relates to the COVID pan pandemic. The role and function of the Department of Gender Affairs is primarily to raise awareness of gender-related issues including health issues, especially on behalf of vulnerable populations. This is done through advocacy, education, and empowerment, utilizing programs that promote gender equality, growth, and development. The department cannot do it alone, do not have the capacity to do it alone. And that is why we utilize a multi-agency and holistic approach by forming partnerships and collaboration with the public and private sector, faith-based organizations, NGOs, civil society, and international agencies. 
The department function on the legislative and policy framework, which is guided by international and regional commitments, such as the Sustainable Development Goal, CEDA, and other conventions, which requires periodic country reports. Nationally, the protection of complainants has been strengthened with the development of the Domestic and Sexual Violence Complaint and Response Protocol in consultation with key stakeholders, including the private and public sector, NGOs, faith-based organizations, and civil society. The protocol was launched in 2018, which sets out the roles and responsibilities of key stakeholders involved in domestic violence. The department's priority at this time include A, the completion of the implementation process for the complaint and response protocol, B, the continued development of the national gender policy, C, the formal submission of the St. Kitts and Nevis CEDA report, which speaks to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, D, Poverty Alleviation, E, the Empowerment of Women and Girls, F, Program for Men and Boys, and G, Gender Sensitization. As we face the COVID-19 global pandemic and its health and economic effects, gender inequalities are often intensified during difficult times. Accordingly, the restriction on movement means that more persons are required to stay at home, which can be challenging, especially those persons facing difficult relationships and who usually do not spend a lot of time together. UNFPA has also stated that evidence from prior outbreaks indicate that women and girls face higher risk of intimate partner violence and other forms of domestic violence due to heightened tension in the household. Statistical data from the local police intelligence office for the period January to April 2020, as it relates to the types of cases being handled by the Department of Gender Affairs, indicates the following. A total of 67 cases of domestic violence were reported involving 57 females and 10 males. It includes 48 cases of physical abuse, 15 cases of verbal abuse, one case of financial abuse, three cases of psychological abuse, and other offenses such as 14 threats to kill and 40 cases of battery. The support services available at the Department of Gender Affairs include, but are not limited to referrals to a number of departments, organizations, and agencies, such as social services, legal aid, the Labor Department, pastoral counseling, faith-based organizations, clinical counseling, mediation, the National Housing Corporation, and the Special Victims Unit. Having shared that information with you on the role and function of the Department of Gender Affairs, I will now update you on our current activities as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of capacity, the department is currently operating at the level of three officers working at reduced hours as we strive to adhere to the COVID-19 protocol. Accordingly, persons seeking information from our office can do so by calling 662 5492. However, if you decide to visit the offices, you are expected to sanitize your hands, wear a mask, and be prepared to practice social distances. Distancing. Our office currently operates from two locations. The main office, which is located at the Ministry of Community Development on Victoria Road, and the second office located at the Newtown Community Center. The working hours are from 8 a.m. to 12 noon, on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. If you are a victim of domestic violence, and if for any reason you are feeling afraid, there are a number of agencies available to help you. These include the Department of Gender Affairs at 662-5492, the Special Victims Unit at 665-3091, the Counseling Unit at 662-8086. In addition, emergency assistance can be sought from the COVID-19 hotline at 311. Further information on the Department of Gender Affairs can be found on, on, its face, on its Facebook page 
at www.facebook.com slash Department of Gender Affairs St. Kitts slash or email skngenaff at gov.kn. Finally, I want to thank all healthcare workers, particularly the doctors and nurses, for their selfless commitment to service in such a time as this. Happy International Nurses Day to all nurses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Christopher, Director of the Department of Gender Affairs. I now invite Superintendent Cromwell Henry, Divisional Commander for District A, to give us his report, Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and good afternoon, all. This afternoon, I will start my report with the arrest figures. There have been two arrests over the last 24 hours. So to date, the number of arrests stands now at 130. I have some announcements. The traffic department has advised that driver's road tests will resume on Monday, 18th May. Written tests will commence on Wednesday, the 20th May, and will be held on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays weekly at 1 p.m. at the St. Johnson's Community Center. So every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 1 p.m., the written tests will be conducted at the St. Johnson Community Center. All the COVID-19 protocols will be observed during these tests. So students will, students will be adequately spaced in the room to satisfy the physical distancing protocol Therefore, a limited number of persons will be permitted to sit the test at any one time. To accommodate everyone, two sessions will be held on each day if the numbers require this. Similarly, the hygiene, distancing, and mask wearing protocols will be required for the road tests. So we ask both students and instructors to understand the situation and to give the department your fullest cooperation. Remember, you are required to pay for the tests at the Inland Revenue Department and have your receipt and other documents available when you come to do the tests. I have another announcement notice from the Defense Force, Sinkis Nevis Defense Force. It has been observed that members of the general public are increasingly wearing the camouflage face mask. Members of the general public are reminded that it is an offense in law, contrary to Section 215 of the St. Christopher and Nevis Defense Force Act, to be in possession of or wear any item of military gears. As such, the St. Christopher Nevis Defense Force advises against the wearing of these masks by members of the general public. The camouflage masks are military kits and must be treated as such. Anyone found in possession of or wearing the camouflage or any material nearly resembling mask will they will be confisc it will be confiscated and the perpetrators will be prosecuted. I wish to add the support of the police force to this notice and that police force will be vigilant in enforcing this particular restriction. Members of the public should not be wearing any item of military clothing, be it masks, pants, shirt, hat, or any other similar gear that is, wear by, that is worn by the military. While we are on the topic of masks, we cannot overemphasize this too much, there is a need for businesses to take steps to protect your property against persons who may be using masks to conceal their identity for illegal purposes. You are advised to implement measures to deter such actions. Measures could include restricting the wearing of hoodies, 
caps, sunshades, and ski masks while on your premises. Having persons remove the masks temporarily so that your surveillance systems can capture their image or requiring IDs when conducting transactions, etc. These measures are particularly important at business places where high value items or cash are traded. We remind you that you are responsible for your security and we ask you to take this responsibility serious. The Royal St. Christopher Nevis Police Force stands ready to support you in any way that you require, just reach out to us and we will provide support while you seek to secure your premises and your property. Again, we ask you to take your own security very serious and take measures to prevent yourself becoming a victim by persons wearing masks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Henry. I now invite our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, to give us the Health Emergency Operations Center COVID-19 Situation Report. Dr. Laws. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and a pleasant good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, today, May 12th, I'm going to be presenting the Health Emergency Operating Center's Situation remote, uh, Report using the PowerPoint format. Today is International Nurses Day, and we all join in saluting all the nurses here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Now it was on March 11th that the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus disease outbreak as a pandemic. And since then, the virus has infected 4,098,018 confirmed cases, and it has killed over 283,000 persons globally. This virus has caused unprecedented changes to date, changes in the way courts operate, changes in the way we praise and worship. Now, just this morning, the COVID-19 task force would have spent almost three hours in dialogue with the faith-based leaders here in St. Kitts and in Nevis. And the purpose of this meeting uh, was to di discuss and determine what would be the new norm in terms of church and worship going forward. To date, the Minister of Health would have tested 334 persons. Uh, we've just had 15 confirmed cases to date. 318 results would have returned negative and today we only have one uh, result pending. It's now about 23 days since we would have last announced the case, our 15th case. We have uh, 11 cases in kits, four cases confirmed Nevis. Today, we have 52 persons quarantined in a government-assigned facility, and we have two persons quarantined at home. We have one case uh, remaining. That individual is isolated. And to date, we have six, 760 persons who would have been released from quarantine. Uh, this slide just highlights the, the uh, Minister of Health's protocol with respect to quarantine and testing. And so if per chance an individual, a national, uh, returns to the Federation after uh, you know, submitting a written request and, and 
after approval would have been granted, that individual automatically goes into quarantine in a government assigned facility and they would remain in quarantine for at least 14 days. Uh, they are not tested immediately upon arrival in the Federation or they are not tested you know, upon arrival into the quarantine facility. They are tested on day 14 of quarantine. Uh, that individual would be released from quarantine if they remain symptom free and if their COVID-19 RT-PCR tests would have returned negative. I also want to underscore that this protocol is not new and this has been in vogue for a couple of weeks now. Uh, let's, uh, you know, fast, you know, go back to when the Cuban uh, contingent came into country. They remained in quarantine uh, for 14 days, I think even a little beyond 14 days. They were sampled and tested uh, on day 14 of quarantine. Okay, so to date, we have 14 persons who would have recovered, um, 10 send kits and 4 on Nevis. And I, you know, I you know, keep saying that the average duration of time between diagnosis and recovery uh, stands at approximately 30 days. All right, and so uh, we have been successful in containing the first wave of infections and we've achieved this through a comprehensive COVID-19 operational uh, response uh, endeavor. And we, the, the, the team, the health team have all contributed and we are happy to note that we have been successful in containing the first wave of COVID-19 infections. And today, International Nurses Day, I want to, to, to salute all the nurses within the Federation. On behalf of myself and the Minister of Health, we want to wish all the nurses a very happy International Nurses Day. We want to thank you for the care and your contribution to healthcare within the Federation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Laws, for, for that report. I would now invite Mr. Abdia Samuel, Chair of the COVID-19 National Task Force and National Disaster Coordinator at NEMA to give us his report. Mr. Samuel. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Williams, and good afternoon all those who are tuning via all means. Uh, welcome to this 43rd briefing of the NEOC. I, I want to highlight uh, Les Wise's shirt. He's very tropical today. Uh, maybe he could have invited me to be as tropical as him today. Uh, let me acknowledge all the nurses. Uh, it's nice when we can highlight you. Actually, my mother was a nurse. Uh, she practiced nursing in the Dominican Republic for many years. So uh, kudos to all the nurses. My report today begins with a number of activities that we would have uh, gone through today. Uh, Dr. Lars would have mentioned one of the key uh, meetings that we would have had today, and that was the meeting with the church leaders. Uh, was a very fruitful meeting, very encouraging, stimulating, as I myself endeavor to go to church soon and very soon. Uh, the meeting was held with the Christian Council and the Evangelical Association and some other key pastors. Uh, some of the uh, deliverables of the meeting that we discussed was the duration of service and the number of services that can be held in one day, the transitioning period between services in terms of sanitization 
uh, having to sanitize this, the church before another group comes into worship. Uh, we look at the uh, sanitization program, um, having maybe, uh, maybe make a health wardens that will clean and uh, carry out also uh, safety precautions during, during, uh, before, during, and after each service. We also spoke about the vulnerable groups, persons with underlying conditions, and also our elders in the church. However, we noted that even though the UN, uh, the UN classifies an elderly from the age of 60, we know that now the 60s and the uh, 60s in your 50 and 70s in your 60. So we looked at some of these uh, measures to see how we can reach uh, an agreement in the interest of public safety. And we also looked at the no, um, some of the measures such as physical contact and the capacity of the churches using the six feet distancing north, east, south, and west. Uh, we will have a further discussion to include a broader base of uh, faith uh, church leaders, and this will be held on the 14th of March uh, 2020 at 10.30 a.m. Uh, if I am not mistaken, Dr. Laws would have announced that uh, the venue for this meeting will be at the Antioch Church here next to Nima. Uh, subsequent to that, we had a meeting at about 2 p.m. today uh, with the uh, Marine Resources to discuss a proposal that was submitted by Mr. Mark Williams, director of this said uh, entity in terms of uh, how do the fishermen, fishermen uh, are able to conduct fishing activities during need of full lockdown days and also fishing at nights. Uh, we spoke about hygiene protocols, the capacity of vessels as per their sizes, and we also look at security, we also discuss security concerns and the sale of fish through the fisheries and also the storage of unsold fish by the fishermen. So we look at a broad section of, of, of um, thematics uh, that we needed to address. Uh, I am hopeful that going forward we can come up to come to an understanding where we can make so, to some submissions on behalf of the fishermen for action. The Senkits Athletics uh, and its corporate partners, Flow and First Federal Credit Union, for the month of May, have partnered with Rams and Value Mart to make available food baskets for the nation. This exercise is being carried out in both St. Kitts and Nevis. So the general public is hereby encouraged to support this exercise by donating dry and canned goods when leaving the following establishment. One, Rams Supermarkets and Buckley's, Two, Rams Cash and Carry. Three, Rams Supermarket Boardwalk. Four, Rams Express at Royal Plaza. Five, Rams Supermarket and Nevis. And six, Value Mart and St. Kitts and Nevis. The compliance team continues to carry out its work. Today, they would have visited a total of 46 businesses. From the stats that I have before me, uh, the percentages are showing that businesses are becoming more and more compliant uh, uh, to us. That is a plus as we seek to continue the fight against COVID-19. Uh, you, you keep hearing that it's an all of society's approach and the business sector has to play their role. So I want to uh, applaud those businesses who continue to comply and those businesses who needs to get to become compliant I'm asking you to do so expeditiously as we swell, as we celebrate international nurses day today we recognize the exceptional work that our nurses have been doing during this fight against COVID-19 Dolores Gomes is a kitchen and retired nurse who worked in several countries she is currently the founder and secretary of RENTALS. RENTALS, the acronym stands for 
the retired energetic nurses touching, touching all lives based in St. Kitts. She has presented red roses to members of Rental today and will do likewise for those at the JNF come Friday. They are going to donate a total of 175 red roses to the nurses. I would like to read the following. I will, I will try to go slow so that Ms. Jacob could, could follow. It is well known, it is a well known fact that nurses are the backbone of the healthcare delivery system. One may find such documentation in every nursing journal and in every reference written. Nurses are the global workforce in primary, secondary, and tertiary care institutions within the private and public sector. The critical role that nurses perform cannot be overlooked and is worthy of the highest praise or commendation. I applaud all nurses around the world working during this time of COVID-19. Thank you. You are blessed and loved. Let us celebrate a day just for you on May 15th. We'll call it Love a Nurse Day. Each year, Florence Nightingale Day is celebrated on May 12th by the International Council of Nurses. Around the world, it is known as Nurses Day. The theme this year, Nurses, a voice to lead, nursing the world to health, is most appropriate. This is, precise, this is precisely what nurses are doing today with COVID-19, risking their lives and that of their families. In August of the year 2000, at the Hilton Hotel Trinidad, the incoming president of the Caribbean Nurses Organization said in her speech, and I quote, the health of a nation is the wealth of a nation. Today, those words are echoed in every country, of every country affected by COVID-19. Leaders around the world are, are allocating, lending, borrowing, or making money. But it is important to note, no one can create a ready-made nurse. Nurses are all human, created by the creator to care for his people. Let us love nurses and treat, treat them with respect. One cannot visualize a hospital or health institution functioning without nurses and the other healthcare workers. There is a poem called, No Indispensable Man. But in times like these, I can see nurses, doctors, and healthcare workers becoming indispensable. In every health situation, nurses must be at the forefront with little or no recognition. I appeal to government leaders to step up to the plate and recognize nurses for who they are. Annette Kennedy, president of ICN states, and I quote, Together as nurses, we hold the power to influence, to drive change, and to call for action. Only nurses hold a unique understanding and innate knowledge about patient history, diagnose healthcare needs, personal worries, and concerns of patients, family, and more. End of quote. It is the nurses who knows and understand all that is required to administer care to patients and not the policy makers, politicians, doctors, social workers, or other disciplines. Nurses need to be recognized, this informal power which is unique to the nurses. The time has come for nurses to represent nurses and be on every health board speaking to nurses. Only nurses can do nurses best. All nurses, healthcare workers, thank you for your dedication, faithfulness, resourcefulness, creativity, humanity, and perseverance in these troubled times. May 15th, it's Love a Nurse Day. Send a nurse a red rose. Show her that you care. To the rest of us, let us adhere to the instructions given by the COVID-19 National Task Force and keep our federation healthy. Who cares for the nurse and the healthcare workers? It is you, it's me, the whole community. Join me in sending a nurse a rose with love. Colleagues, as we nurse the world back to health, I pray that God protects and bless you abundantly Happy nurses there from a nurse who cares. I wish, my, I wish to continue with my acknowledgement by uh, 
also bringing to light the donation that was made, made by Quartz Limited. And Quartz would like to let the populace of St. Kitts and Nevis know that today, more than ever, we are by your side. The Unicomer Group continues to donate in countries in which we operate to assist the fight against COVID-19. Today, we are donating two forehead infrared thermometers to JNF Hospital and NEMA. To you, I say thank you on behalf of these institutions. I also wish to highlight the community policing group. Uh, during the state of emergency and accompanying curfews and lockdowns, one group that has been undoubtedly depressed is the children. There has been and will, not, and will no doubt continue to be limited opportunity to socialize for a long time. The leadership of the Explorers Youth Clubs came up with the idea of holding a virtual concert as part of the Explorers' response to COVID-19. Police Inspector Rosemary Isles Joseph, therefore, reached out to parents of children in all the Explorers Club and invited parents to encourage their children to do some performance at home. The video, the video they, they were asked to videotape it and submit the video. Technical assistance was then sought and provided by a parent whose children are members of one of the Explorers Club. The, 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 this exercise resulted in the production of about a one and a half hour duration video featuring a total of 49 children in these videos who were reciting poems, dramatizing, singing, dancing, and drumming, amongst other things. The video production has been posted on the Explorers fix Facebook page and YouTube, and you can also follow, find it on the Nemo Facebook page. The production slogan, Explorers, Conquerors, and Overcomers. Explorers may be locked down, but they will not stay down. We want to thank Good Entertainment for the, we, sorry, we, we thought it's Good Entertainment for the entire family to watch during curfews and lockdown days. Enjoy quality time with the Explorers virtual presentation. And finally, I want to acknowledge that uh, unanimous person who donated a very nice, simple gift to Miss uh, Christmas Jacob. To you, we say thank you. Uh, I told Miss Jacob uh, she lit the, the, the country now that she can speak as well. Because when she finishes here, she always comes and have a little conversation. To you, Ms. Jacobs, we say thank you for the uh, sacrifice that you make every day to be here. So we look forward to your questions at this moment. Thank you very much, Mr. Samuel, for your presentation. That brings us to the question and answer segment. The first question is from the St. Kitts Nevis Observer newspaper. With the virus cases almost gone and never an epidemic in St. Kitts and Nevis, what role Cuban is playing? What are the plans for them? We said that we aim to flatten the curve and to ensure system by bringing in the Cuban nurses to uh, assist us. Yes, we've been successful in flattening the curve, but there still might be a second wave, and we'll continue to keep the Cuban nurses here until we are sure that we are safely out of this pandemic. Prevention is better than cure. It's good to always have an abundance of caution when you're dealing with something like this. We are not going to ease any of the things that we have put in place, and then we see a spike in cases. And so what I ask everyone is a little patience. Uh, we said early on we needed help. We brought the help in. We will let them go back to their country in due time when we are pretty certain that we are out of the woods and we are over this pandemic. And we're not going to set any dates on the uh, removal of the Cuban nurses. Thank you, Dr. Wilkinson. The second question from St. Kitts and Nevis Observer. More and more Caribbean islands are getting money from the World Bank or the United Nations. 
Is the St. Kitts and Nevis seeking any relief funds? Minister Phipps. Thank you for that question, Mr. Williams. Yes, um, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis is quite aware that a number of our sister states within CARICOM would have accessed relief funding through agencies, Bretton Woods institutions such as the IMF, the World Bank, etc. Among the countries that would have been in that process would have been St. Lucia. I am not certain if Antigua and Barbuda and perhaps also Grenada. What I would want the public to understand, however, is that funding from the World Bank and the IMF is not free money. These are monies that are paid with interest. St. Kitts and Nevis went through a very dire period in our, hard, in our country, which was characterized by significant hardship brought about by the fact that we had no choice but to go to the IMF. This team unity government has prided itself on the commitment the conservative spending and thrift in being able to pay off the IMF. It is not a situation that we plan to put ourselves in another time if we can avoid it. And as had been indicated by the Honorable Prime Minister on more than one occasion, once we were facing down the barrel of the COVID-19 pandemic, because of the way in which the country's finances had been managed, we were quite able to finance at least the initial outlay of the preparation from our reserve funds. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. This question is from SKN Newsline. The easing of restrictions on the use of beaches has been quite appreciated by many. However, the very limited number of hours available has actually resulted in crowded situations at some of our most popular beaches. This is creating difficulty in physical distancing. Could a higher number of hours be considered to help ease the congestion being experienced, as well as the risks that are associated with large crowds? Dr. Wilkinson. This pandemic has taught us a lot. Uh, a lot of time we hear complaints about the fact that as a developing nation, we do not have enough MRIs, CT scans, and all the fancy robotics that's needed to fight some of the diseases that uh, first world countries are faced with. The good thing about this virus is that the ammunition we need, we all have it here. Personal responsibility, social distancing, cough etiquette, and asking persons to understand that you would need to have some personal sacrifice in getting us through this pandemic. We started off with 24-hour curfews. There are some countries that had lockdowns for several weeks going on months. Thankfully, uh, in our federation, we were able to get through this quite early. And we have a situation now where we have five days where persons are free to move around for normal activity and the beaches were opened up for a limited period of time. What we are seeing is what's called a gradual relaxation as we ensure that persons take the personal responsibility in uh, instituting the social distancing measures within their regular life so that we can continue to control this disease. And if with the four hours that's available to persons, they can exercise the social responsibility and institute the social distancing, then we, would, we might see a resurgence of the disease because we don't know if there is one or there are one or two persons out there who are asymptomatic carriers who can spread the disease. And that's one of the reasons why, even if tomorrow we learn that all of our cases are recovered, we still need to wear the mask. We still need to insist on the uh, social distancing. And so I'm asking you, please, 
just be thankful for the relaxation that has been given. It's a gradual relaxation, and I'm pretty certain that if we continue to exercise the protocols that we ask, you would see further relaxation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilkinson. This question is for Dr. Laws. In response to yesterday's question on quarantine and testing, the Chief Medical Officer admitted that not all quarantined persons were tested before their release. Can she confirm whether any of those persons subsequently required testing and if not, does that necessarily mean it is okay to release persons from quarantine without testing them before exit? Thank you for reading that question, Mr. Williams. Now, I will... It's obvious that the person who posed the question doesn't fully understand our local protocol with respect to quarantine and testing. And so I'll begin by explaining same, and then I'll break down the question and answer each section of the question. Now, in terms of quarantine, St. Kitts and Nevis, our Ministry of Health, we started um, fighting this outbreak from as early as January, late January. So to be specific, January 23rd, we started uh, strengthening surveillance at our ports of entry, particularly the RL Bradshaw International Airport. And so individuals who would have come into country between January the 23rd and March the 25th, they were predominantly tourists. Uh, they were coming from hotspots, some of them, and some from uh, countries where by the risk of exposure to the virus was low. So some of these incoming travelers, they were placed in quarantine, they were observed for the onset of symptoms, and actually some of them left and returned to their home country before even completing the 14 days quarantine. And so if they remained symptom free, they were not tested. And so that's why we are saying that uh, the total number of persons released from quarantine, 760, not all of those 760 were tested because they would have come into country between January the 23rd, 2020 and March the 25th, 2020. Now, March the 25th is a significant date. It's the date when we closed our borders. So that means all, you know, regular commercial flights ceased. So individuals who would have requested, meaning nationals who would have requested uh, to come into country between March 25th and today, May 12th, they are automatically, or they were automatically placed into compulsory quarantine in a government facility. They would have come from hotspots, meaning places where the outbreak is even worse than we, ha we are having it here. And so they had, to, they had to complete 14 days, a minimum of 14 days quarantine and tested on day 14. So anybody who that would have come into country between March 25th and today, compulsory quarantine, government facility, minimum of 14 days, tested on day 14. That's our protocol. The question. In her response to yesterday's question on quarantine and testing, the CMO admitted that not all quarantine persons were tested before their release. So, this aspect of the question sort of misconstrued what I said. All right, so I've just explained that persons who came into the country between January 23rd and March 25th, they may have left quarantine without testing. Anybody that came into country after our borders would have closed on March 25th to present had to go into compulsory quarantine 
14 days, sampled on day 14, tested. Can she confirm whether any of those persons subsequently required testing? And if not, does that necessarily mean it is okay to release persons from quarantine without testing them before exit? So I think this last uh, aspect of the question is a non-question really, because anybody who goes into quarantine now, they are automatically tested on day 14. So they are not released from quarantine until two criteria would have been met. A negative COVID-19 RT-PCR test, and they should and they would have remained symptom-free, meaning exhibiting no symptoms of COVID-19. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laws. These two questions are for the Honorable Minister. It is understandable why an influx of tourists will not be allowed into the country at the moment. However, why will St. Kitts not make arrangements for its own citizens to return home now that the task force is in place? Cases have declined. Cuban healthcare workers are in place. Ventilators and PPE have been increased, and the government has secured a guarded quarantine facility. Given that many citizens stranded abroad do not have dual citizenship or authori authorization to work outside of St. Kitts and are suffering, what else would need to occur for St. Kitts and Nevis to arrange for its own citizens to return home. And the second question, in her address on the commemoration of International Nurses Day, the minister stated that there was an amount allocated in the 2020 budget, delivered in December 2019, for salary increases for nurses. If that is correct, why is the increase only being given this month, May? And would that increase be retroactive to January 2020? Minister Phipps. Thank you for those two questions, Mr. Williams. And if I can deal with the first one as it relates to persons who, as you stated, may be stranded overseas. I just wanted to establish for the record that the government of St. Kitts and Nevis has never and will never deny a citizen of this country the right to return home at any point. To be precise, we have been accommodating in terms of those persons who have wanted to return home. We have had cases, for example, of a young man in Antigua who would have left the Federation to bury his father. And then, of course, with Liat closing down, he was stranded. That young man, got arrangements in place to get himself to St. Kitts. Once there was synchronicity between SCASPA, the Immigration Department, Port Health, and the COVID-19 Task Force, the repatriation would have been facilitated with mandatory quarantine in a government facility. There have been several other stories of that nature. As a result, by extension, any persons who have found themselves overseas and wish to return home to the Federation need only to make that arrangement with their airline carrier, communicate with SCASPA, the, the Port Health Authorities and the COVID-19 Task Force, and similar arrangements will be made for them as well. And your second question, if you can repeat it. Yes, the second question had to do with salary. Sal okay, yes, I think the question, if I can paraphrase or recall how I paraphrase it, is one trying to establish if it is true that in December during the budget presentation, if the increase was put forward, and the answer is yes. There is a YouTube video with it. Um, that video, the um, link for it, um, we can have the Ministry of Health post that on the Facebook page for the Health Promotion Unit so that you can go to the video, you can queue it up, advance the table wherever you want, and then you will find where it was said, down to the penny, as was mentioned in the speech given earlier. Now, yes, 
The second part of the question, will it be retroactive to January? Yes, it would. Every part of the budget that would have been approved is for a fiscal year. That fiscal year begins on the 1st of January of each year. So that is the case. As to why there is a delay, now this is not a matter that I would have been personally responsible for because things of this nature are handled through the Office of the Permanent Secretary and the Human Resources Department. Having said that, however, at the same time, the exercise would have included verification of some 300 staff files at the same time to clarify the rate of increases because it was not automatic because if you're to do that you're assuming all things remain constant that everybody's at the same pay at the same increment state and so forth in the middle of all of that there would have also been the retirement of the then chief um, um, uh, um, personal officer mrs rochester and her succession would have been then dealt with, and of course a period of adjustment would have to be accounted for that. Then we add to that the fact that the country would have gone into pandemic preparation mode, where priority would have been given to security of our borders, security of our people, and administrative matters of that nature would have taken second place in terms of preparing the hospital, the staff, and so forth for the onslaught of COVID-19. Thank you, Minister Phipps. This question is for Superintendent Henry. Concerning the face masks, why allow business places to sell masks and now there are complaints? Superintendent. Thank you for that question. Now, prior to the current state of emergency, masks were prohibited under the Small Charges Act. Now, the World Health Organization, and indeed our own chief medical officer, has recommend, have recommended masks as important to prevent the transmission of, of the COVID disease. And so masks, the wearing of masks was a requirement in our emergency regulations. We are not complaining about the wearing of masks, what we are complaining about or what we are trying to prevent is the misuse of the mass. When you want to use the mass to hide your identity, to commit criminal acts, that is what we are trying to prevent. And we are trying to, well, we are discouraging persons from using the mass for that purpose. And we are at the same time employing our business community in particular, but everyone in general, to have that awareness that some persons may be using the mass for illicit activities and to guard against that and to do all that you can to prevent yourselves becoming victims. So we are not complaining about the wearing of masks. We are trying to sensitize persons so that you do not be victimized by persons who are wearing masks to hide their identity for illegal purposes. Thank you, Superintendent Henry. That was very well addressed. This next question, what can be done to assist single mothers who live alone with their small children? They have been coping alone for several weeks now without their normal support base. Can a close friend who is central to the usual support assist in taking the child for a period of time to allow for some respite? Mrs. Christopher. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Unlike other ministries, the Ministry of Health, Community Development, and Social, Responsible, uh, Social uh, Services has responsibility for, as we would say locally, for persons from the wound to the tomb. In terms of assistance for, social, for single parents, they can access that type of assistance from the Department of Social Services and where children are concerned, they can also access services for children from the Department of Child Protection Services. You can contact the ministry at 467-1275. Uh, Thank you.
Thank you, Mrs. Christopher. This question is for the medical chief of staff, Dr. Wilkinson. I visited the dental clinic at Newtown this morning, and I was informed they are not currently doing any procedures unless it's an emergency because they are awaiting PPE supplies, personal protective equipment. My question is, does the hospital currently have adequate supplies of PPE? And if yes, are these PPE supplies also distributed to the government dental clinic, or are they just for the hospital? Can the dental clinics receive some of the PPE supplies in order to perform procedures until their supplies arrive? Dr. Wilkinson. The reason why the dental clinic stopped doing elective procedures and was only doing emergency procedures is the same reason dental clinics all around the world facing this pandemic had stopped. Because in dental procedures, there are a number of procedures that are gener generate aerosols. And despite the fact that you would be wearing PPEs, uh, the persons are still put at risk. And that's one of the reasons why they were just dealing with emergencies as opposed to elective procedures. And so in the middle of the pandemic, we did not expect anyone to go to a, the government dental clinic or even a private clinic to have you know, an implant or something that was routine. Uh, the reason was not because there was no PPE available. The PPEs are available in all of the uh, government institutions, and there is no shortage of PPEs in any government institution. And as we get more control of this pandemic, we will gradually start to do some elective procedures. Thank you, Dr. Wilkinson. This brings us to our last question for the day, and it goes to Mr. Samuel. When the NEOC task force visits business establishments about new procedures for COVID-19, was it stated that babies are restricted entry to supermarkets, even if the supermarket isn't crowded at the particular time the parent is willing to shop. Parents have no one to hold the baby. And if yes, why is that? Because establishments should be sanitizing hands and surfaces and cleaning other areas regularly. Can a particular time be set aside for persons that have to take the baby out to shop, Mr. Samuel. Um, thank you, Mr. Williams, for the question. Uh, regarding babies and supermarkets and business places, uh, we have not heard of any policy the regulations does not speak to any restrictions of babies or children entering any business place. However, let's, let's be mindful that an establishment has the right to set policies for themselves if necessary. Um, I can recall, though, uh, when we had the, uh, one of the, the early lockdowns where persons were asked to uh, go and seek essential service, uh, services, meaning go to the supermarkets and shop, we sent out earlier some policies. For example, we said one member of the household and nobody under the age of 16. Since then, those, uh, those recommendations have been relaxed. So I don't know of any policy or recommendations regarding first children or babies uh, not being allowed into the premises. However, uh, bearing in mind that we are still facing a pandemic, 
I think it will be in your best interest to do your best, do your best to protect your, your, your babies or your children. And furthermore, I think this discussion has been ongoing whereby recommendations have been given to you regarding how do you get societies uh, support, for example, being your neighbor's keepers, being your brother's keepers, your sister's keepers, in getting your, your neighbor, your family friend, extended family, etc., to assist you in caring for your younger ones, not to expose them to the uh, virus. I think that, that's in a nutshell what I would like to say. And uh, Dr. Laws. Uh, I feel compelled to add that uh, we all have a responsibility in terms of our fighting this virus. Uh, we, we keep saying it's an all of society uh, approach and so even mothers, mothers of children, particularly babies, you have a responsibility to protect your baby, your child from this virus. And uh, that's why we are saying you should only take the baby out. <coughs> Uh, if necessary. Uh, okay, you say it's necessary to go to the supermarket, but I think as a mom, you need to recognize that there is an inherent risk in taking your baby to the supermarket. Yes, uh, we've had the, all the supermarket operators uh, in dialogue in terms of the infection prevention control measures. However, uh, we are not saying that they're going to be perfect in sanitizing the hands of the cats, etc. And so you going into the supermarket with your baby, you're going to have to carry a cat, etc. Uh, and so there is an inherent risk in your going to the supermarket with your baby. And as a mom, you have a responsibility to protect your child from the virus. And so that's where we are appealing to, to moms, single moms. Uh, look into your social network. You know, is there anybody else who can provide coverage of the baby during the time when you're going to the supermarket? Thank you very much, Dr. Laws, and equally, thank you, Mr. Samuel, for your responses. This brings us to the end of today's COVID-19 daily briefing, and in particular, to the answer and question segment. I hope that the questions were answered to your satisfaction. If not, you can always ask a follow-up question on tomorrow's daily briefing. I would like to thank the Minister of State, Wendy Phipps, for her address on the occasion of International Nurses Day. And we congratulate all nurses and all healthcare professionals in the Federation on their day. May they continue doing the work that they love, not just for money, but because it is a vocation. And we also invite more men to join the nursing profession. Equally, I would like to thank Mrs. Celia Christopher, Director in the Department of Gender Affairs, for her enlightening presentation. And we have to stamp out all forms of abuse that is in the Federation. We also thank Superintendent Cromwell Henry for his presentation. The Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, for her presentation on the situation with respect to COVID-19 in St. Kitts and Nevis and her answering of questions. Additionally, Mr. Abdia Samuel, Chair of the COVID-19 National Task Force, we say thank you to you, Mr. Samuel. Thank you to Mrs. Christoph Mrs. Christmas Jacobs for her sign language service that she provides at all of these daily briefings. We say thank you to Dr. Cameron Wilkinson 
our medical chief of staff, who has to answer many of the questions. We say thanks to the media, to ZIZ and to Open Interactive, and to all the media who continue to pose questions from day to day. Thank you very much for your collaboration and your partnership in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Information dissemination is absolutely Im important. We do have an announcement from Skellig. Skellig would like to advise the general public that an electricity supply outage will affect Bellevue to Sadler's on Friday 15th May 2020 from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The outage is required to perform emergency maintenance. Please dial 465-2013 to contact the Skellig emergency hotline for further information. Thank you very much to all of you who joined in today for our COVID-19 daily briefing. Tomorrow we'll be back for another daily briefing. Until then, continue to stay safe and we'll see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. Team sadness and feelings of despair could be some of the things people are noticing in themselves during this unusual time. Pay specific attention to see if you have feelings of discouragement, hopelessness, irritability, difficulty concentrating, and disruptions in eating and sleeping habits. Pay attention to your emotions and talk to someone if they are feeling overwhelming. Focus on positive messages that you get from your environment. Listen to uplifting music, stories, or news items. Distract your thoughts by doing something like reading a book, doing a puzzle, coloring, or playing a game. Humor helps to lift moods. Watch a comedy or have a good laugh with friends. Remember your own strengths. What are some positive things that have helped you feel better in the past? Remember, if you have tried everything and overwhelming feelings of sadness still persist, reach out for professional help. This message comes to you from the St. Kitts Mental Health Association. <laughs>